What's going on, everybody? Jay Curtis Strickland here. You're now watching TNF. Like, comment, share, subscribe, click on that little bell. Today we have with us, um, he was uh, one of the guitar players in hardcore band One Life Crew, uh, currently fronting uh, In Cold Blood. Uh, this is Mr. Blaze Tishko, everybody. And he's, he's finally getting to join us because it was harder to get in touch with him than the president. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, yeah, I'm not really nearly as important, but I, I certainly, you know, in the, it was the, like I said before, with the labor market and the, and the, and the shape that it's in, um, and owning a business, you know, your, your, my time is, uh, I, I'm not just an owner. I'm a, I'm the guy that club street, uh, cleans the toilets, <laughs> you know, dude, and, and, and t tell us about that a little bit, like running a business and especially in today's political and economic climate, because you, like you said, yeah, you do everything basically. I, yeah. Um, so I, I owned I, I owned at one point recently actually as of Mar as of March I had did own two restaurants um, one of them I owned for I owned for 12 years that one is still around uh, the one the second one uh, caught fire in March and did not burn down but basically uh, burned to a point of incapacity they actually tore the building down it was so bad um, so I've only I've been doing just the one obviously since March and uh, it, uh, so since probably really like last summer, boy, it's been the labor market and especially in the service industry and especially in the food service industry is just brutal. You know, um, I, I don't know exactly what the, I think I have an idea what the cause is. There was a point where I would have told you that, you know, it's probably due to a lot of government assistance and everything like that. But with unemployment at 3.6%, I'm not exactly sure that there's enough people for these jobs. <laughs> right. Now, you know, the, 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 uh, the mentality of the younger folk, um, is certainly a little bit rough. And, um, you know, and I think that the, the fact that there's so many of these jobs, um, it's uh, pretty easy to just kind of go and do whatever you want. And, um, you know, there's really not a whole bunch of loyalty and, and there doesn't need to be because, you know, they can they can go anywhere. It wasn't like, you know, when I was in my early 20s, um, it was easy to get a job, you know, making uh, a livable wage working anywhere, really. Um, right. But these days, they're you know, they have th those jobs are everywhere, you know, doesn't right. really matter. So it's it's been it's been tough. And I have to, you know, I have to assume a lot of roles. A lot of them are the the cooking roles because that's the seems to be the job that people want the least and yeah. um it's so it's been, hard I've being been... back there in that hot kitchen you know i i've done it and you know i i it's many many a days walked out of there just covered in sweat and grease and i'm like whoa you know yeah i mean you got to have a passion for it you know yeah. and i do i've done it my whole life i've pretty much never done anything else um since i was 12 years old and uh, I do like it. I love I love serving people. I love seeing people uh, happy, excited about the product they've created. It's not much different than music, to tell you the truth. It's no, very, it's, it's really not. It's really similar, uh, especially in the regard that um, there's no really, you're not going to make any new kind of food that nobody's seen before. And you're probably not going to make any new music that nobody's seen before. <laughs> exactly. That's a good analogy, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But you get the same feeling, though. You know, you really do. You get to kind of feel like you're up on the stage. Yeah. You get to I, see people react to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to what you're creating. You know, one of my services in the temple was cooking for the students at the University of Florida. And I okay. loved it. And, and I mean, I love cooking uh, on my own, you know, because it's something I'm passionate about. Um, and it is really like edifying to see all those people like, you know, just like enjoying something that you've created, you know? Sure. Yeah. There's, there's something to be said for that for sure. And, and I, 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 I guess I'm a, I'm a junkie for that, you know, any way I can get it. I, I love the affirmation. <laughs> now. So, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, you you had been the guitar player for One Life Crew, and you know, in hardcore circles, it's it that album is so elusive, you know, and I can't I can't find it to stream anywhere, and I can't 
You know, yeah, I, I think it's been a race. I think it's been a race from YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've tried to find like torrent sites of it. I've tried to find it to buy online. I wanted to go um, break down a little bit of the history of of OLC and like how it started and and you know kind of the the response to all that and whatnot. Well, I guess the beginning was um, you know I had met Tony through his brother. Uh, I knew his brother before him. He has an older brother that owns a restaurant slash bar. Um, and we used to hang out at this place called United Dairy Farmers. Like, you know, you're 19 years old and nothing better to do. And, and we would just hang out there all night doing nothing, basically. <laughs> and I think one day I walked in with an integrity shirt on. He's like, oh, my brother's in that band or was in that band at that <laughs> point. I was like, what, really? I was like, that's pretty crazy. You know, cause I was a Foster integrity fan and still am to this day. And uh, so eventually I met Tony. Um, and then I met Steve. We ended up going to college together. Tony, Tony didn't go to college, but he lived there. <laughs> I don't know what his job was, but uh, <laughs> definitely wasn't college. But he still lived with us. And um, you know, I just we it, we started at the time. I certainly not that I'm much these days, but I really did not have much talent on guitar. I mean, I can barely really play, but I like doing it. And um, what really I wanted to be in a band forever, and of course, getting an opportunity to be in a band with the guys that I respected and, and certainly liked a lot was a, was a big deal for me at that point. So it started kind of as Bean Streak, uh, you know, which was another band that Steve had had with a guy named Paul Stockter. And it had that one song on the Only the Strong Top. And it never really was a band, but, and then it kind of morphed into this new band, which was One Life Crew. And, you know, the idea was, you know, at the point, at that point in time, I wasn't, you know, I was definitely not into drinking or drugs or anything like that. I just liked to fight. I was a pretty pissed off kid and, and, and getting into trouble and fighting and stuff was, was appealing to me. And that's, you know, those guys are diehard straight edge guys. So, and, uh, you know, not Tony, because Tony's definitely not a fighter, uh, but Steve certainly was uh, uh, attracted to that. And, um, so we just wanted to start something that was, you know, lack of a better word, a tough guy hardcore band, I guess. I don't think the original intention was to do anything political, but, um, you know, Steve saw, I think, a long time ago that being what he was was way more punk than what everybody, you know, what the punks were at that point. You know? That's fucking right. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. like. Uh, and um so you know when that's what's that? what were you gonna say I, I was just gonna say yeah i mean like you know i i think i had gotten in touch with you through a mutual friend of ours though i don't know he would consider himself a friend of mine at this point and um you know just sitting there like it's really difficult to to be able to you know find a lot of like punk and hardcore people that are kind of on the same page like you know as far as uh politically in the way that they see the world and so that was really um you know kind of i was like oh man who is this you know this 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 guy might be cool you know and then you know it, it just doesn't make any sense to me um how the punk and hardcore scene can't really see the world for the way it is and they they want to see it through like rose colored glasses and and you know you you kind of don't agree with that and i don't agree with that and, and why do you think that yeah. is yeah, it's it's definitely become quite strange. I mean, you know, they gave me, I was talking to somebody about Johnny Lydon the other day, and, you know, I mean, Johnny Lydon, he's seen it, you know, and he's like, look, you guys have become everything that you were against. Um, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Know? I mean, he he kinda was a pretty, weird. he was a red pillar for me. Like, he, when he was, like, talking about the stuff he was talking about, like, this is, like, one of the, the OGs, and he's sitting here, like, you guys are fucking morons, you know? I'm like, yeah, yeah, exactly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Steve, Steve was, uh, you know, he was all, if there's one thing I was in the studio at, at uh, Mars with Bill Parecki a, a couple years ago. And I was like, I was thinking, I was like, you know, the cool thing about Steve and certain about Steve was he never wanted to be a rock star. You know, he always, and he certainly doesn't look like a punk rock guy, but he certainly has that attitude. And um, he never had aspirations of like, I want to be a big band, like a sick of it all or something like that. You know, he always wanted to be anti everything that was really going on. And some of that is just because he's, that's just his nature in life. 
and some of that is what he actually believes in. Right. But like I said, the coolest thing was he never really had aspirations to be a rock star. That kind of is what brought, you know, the downfall, I guess you could say, of the band in some regards. Because when I had gotten out, it became a little bit, it got a little too clowny for me. You know, they were almost doing it. They were being anti just for the sake of being anti. And uh, I was like, yeah, this is, you know, I mean, I, we, we, we originally started with this idea um, and it kind of it, it morphed into something that was just, you know, being against it just for the sake of being against it. Sure. You know? And that was, I, I didn't really like the clowny kind of part that, that had come along with it. Um, you know, and then it inhibited a, a lot of ways of being able to do anything, too. I'm really good friends with Aaron and Lenny from Integrity, and obviously I started In Cold Blood with those guys. And they were like, uh, they're like, look, you know, you can do this if you want to do it, but I'm just going to tell you, you know, it's probably going to limit a lot of your options. And, and not that, you know, I mean, it's hard for music. It's not sure. like we're going to go out and make millions and drive Mercedes and BMWs, you know. But right. I do like playing shows, you know, and it got really, because they had become so, so much of a, I don't know, like they, you know, it become, I forget what the word is I want to use, but a polarizing. Um, and, and just for the sake of being polarizing, not right. really because it was like, okay, we really believe this. You know, Tony couldn't even tell you who the vice president of the United States is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, he has no idea. Sure. <laughs> he just goes along with stuff because that's his best friend and, you know, whatever. He'll tell you that himself. He, he, yeah. he, he says it to me all the time. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, at the beginning it was definitely, uh, it was definitely a lot of fun. That's for sure. It was exactly the band I wanted. Um, you know, it got a little more political than I wanted to, but I don't think, you know, when we wrote that song and Steve wrote the lyrics to it, I don't think anybody expected there was going to be this monster backlash from it. And and it was going to be this, you know, we were going to be touted as racists and, all that other stuff we were just you know we were like look hey this is what's going on you know there's uh you know there's this monster immigration problem there's people that are getting put out of work because of it ironically if you were to look you know fast forward now i would be most happy to let uh, a whole bunch of migrant workers in because i don't think i'm not sure we have enough uh, labor in this country at this point right <laughs> you know? yeah and, man uh, P- people are give me a, a group of people that are that are hungry to better themselves um, sounds a lot better than a whole bunch of people that want to do nothing. <laughs> but that, that, and that's the idea. And you're, you're talking about pure disgust, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the idea. I think that, you know, people think that anybody with like right leaning political uh, ideologies thinks that like there there's this massive amount of hate and it's not hate. It's it's all about like, you know, personal betterment and like, you know, you yeah. you doing for you. And, and that's that's what I think a lot of people miss about that. Well, yeah, you know, it's ironic that you get everybody, I mean, there, it seems to be that a lot of people that are very happy to paint this picture, you know, and you saw that happen right after in 2016 when Trump got elected, it was like, okay, if you voted for this guy, you're racist. I'm like, yeah. That is the most insane thing I've ever heard in my life. I right. mean, I, had, I, I did vote for him in 2016. I did it in 2020 because I thought he had kind of become a little bit of a clown show himself. No, I thought his economic policies were absolutely amazing, and nobody can argue with that. I mean, right. we were we were killing it. We were yeah. absolutely killing it. But you know, he I thought he did a couple things that were just you know a little too silly. I'm like, why would you not? You know, all you got to do is just kind of toe the line a little bit more, and you'll you're not going anywhere. You know? Right. It is ironic that you know they had, they needed a pandemic and an economic crisis to get rid of him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. What but 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 see, you and I saw that for what it was, you know. It's like nah, nah. And and all my friends are from like, you know, not not all my friends, but a lot of my friends are from South American countries. They're like, we've seen this play out exactly how it played out, you know. And yeah, and, I'm sure. And, and, and you know, I'm I'm kind of with you. I was I was uh, having an online conversation with one of the dudes from Wisdom and Chains, and he was like, oh yeah, da da da, all the Trump supporters. And I was like. Yeah, I said I voted for him, but he's not, you know, beyond criticism in my book, you know. And sure. and then we had like a really good conversation. He was like, yeah, you know, da 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 da. Hey, you know, thanks for responding this way, you know. And I was like, oh, cool, you know. And and it was, it was, it was fine. It was peaceful. And and I was like, why can't we have more of these conversations, you know? Sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, you're going to have to, uh, it's it's hard for people, a lot of people, it's not everybody, obviously, but it's hard for them to see compromise, you know, it's like, and that's, that's what our government is, and it's what it has to be, and right. not everybody's going to get their way all the time, and there has to be some compromise, and that's why you see nothing get done, because, you know, they're so hard in everything that they have to do, and, you know, a lot of it they're beholden to, as far as the companies that they work for, but, um, yeah, it's 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 sad that and you know the thing is what I've also noticed is if you go out and talk to people in the world, it's a lot different than what's going on on social media. You know, oh, the, sure. there, there's radicals. Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of them, but it seems like if you just go out and talk to your neighbor, you know, they're not nearly as radicalized as you may as you may think that they are exactly. based on what you see on the internet. People mm-hmm. people feel emboldened because they got that computer screen in front of oh, them and they gosh. think they can just say whatever they want, carte blanche. You know. I mean, owning a business, it's, you really see it because, you know, they're, they have no guts to, to say something in person, something that they were unhappy with or whatever, you know. Right. I, would say, I would say probably 19 out of 20 times, you know, instead of somebody saying something to me in person or even making a phone call, you know, they just go on the Internet. It's right. Like, you know what? And, and it, I don't want to give – I can't give you what you want because you're being a pussy. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, truthfully. And, you know, see, I've I've invited a bunch of people on this show and I'm like, look, if your ideas are so great, if what you believe is so sound, come on here and rationalize your viewpoints. Like, like, make me understand something that I'm not understanding, you know, and and it never happens. You know, they just want to shout and they just want to, you know, like they just want to basically try to put you down until you just submit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. It's it's a yeah, real drag. It, yeah, the One Life Crew thing, it got, you know, when it became a Republican band, it became a little bit too much. Now, I mean, I, I, I guess for, you know, for many years, I certainly would have identified as a Republican. Sure. Um, these days, I try hard not to identify as anything except independent or libertarian at best. Right. Just because, you know, I don't, I, I think being attached to this, one of these groups, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, is you're basically just giving them what they want. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And that was another thing to, to me. It was hard to kind of like cede to any one side, you know, I was just like, well, I'm just going to vote for Republicans because that's who uh, yeah, put us in a good of, economic of, state for the past four years. There are two evils basically. And, 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 and that's the way that it's been worked for some time now. I mean, We've had a two-party system since the inception of this country. Well, and it's... yeah, and I mean, well, there were also a lot of other political parties that kind of like got swept by the wayside, you know, like uh, sure. like the Whigs and uh, who was the other ones? Uh, the, well, I mean, they had like the Democratic Republicans, but yeah, I mean, it's largely been like a two two party system. I mean, it exists much the same way like in the English Parliament. I think they've got some other parties and whatnot, but. Yeah, I mean, there doesn't leave a lot of room for a lot of choice, you know. So you, yeah. you being a business owner, um, me being an independent financial or independent creative person, you know, we want the best financial situation for you know everybody, and ultimately, like one that l- limits us from you know heavy taxation stuff like that. And so, yeah. really, that that's that's all. I'm like, hey, you know, if the Republicans, if the right has this idea, well, sure, you know, why not? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's no denying that their economic policies, for the most part, have been much more fruitful than 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 what's been going on with the Democratic Party. Right. I mean, we, we look back to to the late '70s, and you know, I, I, it really feels like we're in the Carter era again. You know, not that I, I mean, I was quite young at that time, but right. I've certainly heard a lot of the stories, and if anything, it's probably worse. What do you feel like people are getting wrong about One Life Crew? Oh, I guess the biggest misconception is that we don't like black people <laughs> or, you know, I guess I, I should say that with a grain of salt because I haven't been in the band for quite some time. It's probably been since the late nineties, really. Although I did play a couple of shows since then. Um, but being an active member has been quite some, some time, but the biggest misconception is the racist part for sure. Um, I mean, you've never seen two guys that like black people more than Tony and Steve. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people, you know, they would, they're also Jewish. Um, so, you know, but a lot of times you say that to people like, well, it doesn't matter because Jewish people can be racist too. And I'm like, okay, I get that, but it's a little contradictory. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Considering how, how much 
the the Jews have suffered throughout history, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I mean those guys have have done no have done no help to themselves, and it's on purpose, you know. They they they're, they're, they they kind of come from the ilk where, you know, when they somebody starts throwing mud at them, they just take a jump right into it and start spinning around. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I love that like, though. No, I mean to, like, they're like we're not going to change anything. We're just going to dive in deeper. You know? Sure, <laughs> contrarian for the sake of being contrarian. Yeah, and I mean I, I can get where that would be a little bit like. You know, like I see what you guys are doing here, but uh, you know, and and I, you know, you were saying like the guys in uh, in Cold Blood and Integrity are like, well, you know, like we don't really care, but if you do this, like yeah. it's gonna it's gonna limit you. And you know, I, I'm I'm feeling that a little bit. You know, I've gotten people from both sides of the political spectrum, but people are like, this is a right wing show. And it's like, no, it's not. Like I just want to have conversations with people, like real organic conversations with people. You know, and like. Let's hear what you have to say. Maybe your ideas will convince me, you know? Who knows? Exactly. I mean, that's the re that's how I've gotten to where I am today. A lot of it was being exposed to 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 Aaron and Lenny and you know, the Aaron and Lenny are are diehard left wingers and uh I'm Aaron, Lenny a little bit more so than than Aaron. Um, you know, they're also Jewish and their their father it couldn't be more um uh, for lack of a better word, atypical Democrat Jewish guy. <laughs> really right. eclectic and very left wing or whatever, but the, the exposure to their ideas is what's maybe what I am today. And, you know, not even just politically, but, you know, in a lot of ways, it's just exposure to culture and all that other stuff of course. Um, that I probably would never have really gotten had I not, you know, uh, been you know, able to listen to what their ideas were. Sure. I mean, like, that's one thing I think the left definitely has on the right is, like, culturally. I think, art, like, culturally, artistically, like, you know, they, they've kind of got the that on, on lock, you know. But, um, and, you know, I have a lot of left-wing friends, too, and I'm like, you know, let's just put this aside, like, especially when you go to, like, a hardcore show or you're just hanging out, like, let's just, like, yeah. talk about music or, or films or sports or something like that, like, Something that's not polarizing. I mean, you know, the, my parents' generation, their parents' generation, like, you didn't talk about politics, like, when you were no. just, you know, you just didn't. You didn't even know what, who, you didn't talk about who somebody voted for. Right, you know. It was you, a very personal thing. That's why it's in a booth. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and I'm, I'm even thinking I mean, about you didn't that. Really like, know what people thought. I'm even thinking about that more often because, you know, when I when I said I voted for Trump, like, whoo, like, dude, boom, like, gone, gone, friends, uh, out of here, you know? Uh, I think you went on mute, brother. I think you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, okay, you're good. Yeah. Yeah, just a, um, a slew of people just just stopped talking to me, and I'm like... You. Yeah, you got labeled. Yeah. Yeah, and that's really weird because, you know, you don't really... You know the the, the the idea that they're purport they're, 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 they they have supposedly is that we don't put labels on people, you right. know. <laughs> right. And uh, I, I that part was really it was disturbing to me to see how bad that got. It was yeah. like, you know, you don't know what's in my mind. You have no idea. You know, right. I could be walking around in my backyard with a KKK hood on. You know, I could have uh, I could be donating to the ACLU, ACLU or the NAACP. Exactly. Um, you know, half my money. You have no yeah. idea. <laughs> you know? Right. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, people people size you up, you know, based on appearance or preconceived notions or whatever. I mean, I, you know, I got I got all my like black clothes and stuff like that. And people are like, oh, you know, you're fucking Antifa affiliated. I'm like, no, no, no. You know, but <laughs> I, I almost thought about going to the FBI like, yo, if you need like a plant, like I kind of look like these guys. So <laughs> I kind of know how they operate, you know, uh, but no, I, I couldn't do that. But um, so are you still doing in, in cold blood at present? Oh yeah, yeah, still playing. Um, I'm actually not the front man anymore. We got a singer about oh geez, I don't know, it's probably two years ago or something like that. Oh wow! So I uh, I sang on the or yelled, I should say, I yelled on the last record, uh, the second to last record we made. We did make another one that hasn't come out yet. Um, but since that time, um, we we did get a singer, Michael Michael Torres, Michael Chops Torres. He's been oh, in the nice. band like I said, for about two years now. And uh, I, I got to the point where it was a little, a lot of it was, well, for one, singing and playing guitar is hard, especially when you're fat and old, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I felt like I was not very, I was, I was doing, I, I, I separately, I could do them okay. Together, I was probably not that great. Oh, it's hard. Um, yeah, you know, and it was a little hard to get the crowd involved because of it, whatever. 
but um, um, so I decided, and you know, I my passion really is guitar. I did this. I did the yelling, be, you know, kind of by default because I had to. Well, In Cold um, Blood started as a three piece, done. right? No, well, technically, the first version of In Cold Blood was uh, was Chubby Fresh on drums, and then Aaron and Lenny and me, and Frank Novinick was the singer. Oh, and wow. we were called, we were called Scarred for Life, and that was like ninety seven or something like that. And uh, um, and that didn't last too long. It was fun. it was fun. You know, we really wanted to start at that time. Like you know, bands like Snap Place and like Earth Crisis and stuff were were kind of the bigger bands, and you know, hardcore was definitely taking more of a metal tinge to it. Not nearly what it is today, but um, it was for us. It was getting extremely metal. We're like, we want to make like a like a hardcore, hardcore band, you know, like Victim in Pain, you know, let's yeah. do, you know, more like Negative Approach or something like that. And it started off like that. And then, you know, we kind of, you know, being like guitar nerds that we are, uh, that kind of got boring pretty fast. We're like, oh, we miss solos. So <laughs> we, yeah, we, yeah. maybe we need to. So you see a lot of like, you know, Ink Old Blood over the, the, the 20 some years of its existence has kind of gone all over the place as far as what the style is. Yeah, but definitely. But it certainly started off wanting to be victim in pain and age of quarrel that's for sure yeah yeah um yeah no uh, by the way did you get that record i don't think i ever did i even went to the post office and asked for it are you serious yeah dude i i have a feeling there was some mail theft involved because when i heard you didn't get it i was like what this is crazy you know yeah uh, it would be great to have but i did not have a copy <sighs> oh man fuck you usps you motherfuckers <laughs> that's um well, I been a while since i've been up there i can go up and try again maybe i don't know i i, I should but call them it, actually you to, did you send it to my home i don't remember i don't even remember i'll look into it um but uh yeah usps rigging elections and stealing in cold blood records you motherfuckers fuck you. <laughs> um no that's cool though man yeah no i i was I, I loved the hell on earth record i thought it was uh fucking fantastic and when you know i i had a uh my buddy, he he sold me that copy, and I was like, "Yeah, sure." And you're like, "Man, I wish I had a copy." And I was like, "Well, you need a copy." I was like, "You were in the band." I was like, "Shit, I, there's no there's no way I can hang on to this, you know." So, but fuckers. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um. No, man. Um. So, like, are are you guys playing out? Are you guys that? That's oh yeah, probably... yeah. So yeah, we still we still do it. We're actually playing with Integrity in Cleveland next weekend. Oh wow. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I mean, dude, we're all, I'm the only guy in the band that has, that's married and has kids. So I have more, and obviously, uh, you know, at one point there are two businesses, but still one that, that takes up a ton of my time. Sure. So I have a lot more commitments than those guys do. Um, uh, so it gets, it's tough. You know, it's not like I'm going to drop everything and go on tour or anything like that anytime soon, especially not now. Right, um, right. So, but we've been able to play out, you know, here and there, you know, out of town a couple times sporadically. And it's, you know, it, it's for fun. You know, I, I like the, you yeah. know, Aaron and Lenny aren't in the band anymore. And they haven't been for quite some time. And uh, so I, I've known, um, the other guitarist, Ryan, I've known him for 20 plus years. And, you know, for me, I just do it. It's, an, it's a release, you know, it's a positive release. It's better than going out and getting wasted, um, doing something destructive. That's for sure. And, yeah. um, you know, it's just fun to just get with my friends and do dumb stuff and play music. Sure, I don't get sure. a chance to do it at home, really. So, you know, it's like I kind of force myself to go out and play guitar. Yeah, yeah. That's cool, man. Um, no, uh, you had mentioned Earth Crisis earlier because, you know, one of the things. What what was the controversy with Carl from Earth Crisis that warranted that, that funny phone call? I just think that those guys, you know, at the time, I think that they were like kind of the, you know, they were the figurehead, so to speak, of, of hardcore. So why not, you know, if he's going to start, start shit with anybody, those were the guys to start shit with. And, you know, it, it was, you know, I guess for lack of a better word, they were kind of easy marks. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it was funny. It was funny because I was like, where where did this stem from you know and like he's he's like what what are you talking about <laughs> i don't think anything like they didn't do anything you know it was no fault of their own it was just they just happened to be in bands that were like that were kind of changing the course of the music that we loved and sure, that's sure. probably the main reason <laughs> <laughs> that cracks me up man that's just that's just funny you know like like hit them because they're they're big targets i love that 
Um, yeah, you know, that and like I said, and, and and what they represented at the time was was definitely a changing of the guards as far as you know hard, what hardcore was. You know, we wanted fast parts and dance parts, and and they yeah. wanted uh, a, a song that was all dance parts. Right. <laughs> you know? They're like, we'll be the next Sepultura or something. Um, uh, kinda, kinda, yeah. That Slither but album no, was. They never, they never did anything. It wasn't any fault of their own, except the music they were creating, I suppose. Yeah, it, it would almost be interesting if it was one of those things like to create controversy just for the sake of creating controversy. Like, like um, what, uh, what's his name? Herzog and, and Klaus Kinski, the director and the actor, they did that shit a lot. Just just to like get attention to things, you know? Sure. Yeah, you well, know. Cleveland has been pretty notorious for that over the years. <laughs> yeah. What, what, what's it like living up there? Is it is it pretty... Uh... I've never, I think I've maybe passed through Cleveland, but what, what, I mean, you, obviously you're up there, you like yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it's Northeast America, great summers, shitty winters, you know, yeah. I think that, you know, not much different than what happened with, uh, with Black Sabbath and the, the environment that, that spawned some of the music was, uh, was, you know, the reason the music, the way it was, was probably due to the environment. I mean, Cleveland was definitely a pretty shitty place to live. Yeah. in the uh, 80s and the 90s and definitely was made fun of and and uh so you know just like being in Birmingham and gray and yeah. and crappy you know cleveland was definitely kind of the same way um it, it's i've been here my whole life for the most part i love it i live about 45 minutes east of cleveland so i'm out in the middle of nowhere and and uh, it's very rural and it's actually like kind of an Amish community to tell you the truth. Oh, wow. Um, very, yeah, it's, it's, it's the fourth largest Amish community in America. So there's a lot of Amish, but I'll tell you how rural it actually is just being 45 minutes east of Cleveland. But sure. I did in the 80s and 90s, I lived in the city. Um, you know, everybody else pretty much did too or really close to the city. And, um, you know, like I said, I think that was a, that was the reason the music was as pissed as it was was because of that, you know, probably not that much different than, than New York, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, um, I always ask this question at the end. What, what have you been watching, like films, television, arts, culture? Oh, jeez, that's a great question. Um, I'm a Star Wars nerd, so I yeah. haven't watched anything, anything Star Wars. You've been watching uh, the Kenobi Obi-Wan? then? I have. I saw the first three, I think, so far. Yeah, the I just watched the last one. The two were definitely pretty, uh, pretty slow. Um, but you know, I, you know, it's like, to me, it's like, uh, you know, like, it's like, I love Entombed and I like Kiss and Kiss is, Kiss and Entombed are like two of those bands that even when they're, even their bad songs are good. Yeah. And yeah. Star Wars is kind of the same way. <laughs> like, yeah. I think Star Wars is driving on TV. Something like it, you know, it's like, okay, at least I'm kind of close, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think but Star Wars on Phantom television Menace. is great. The Phantom, you know? Menace is, the Phantom Menace is torture. Oh, Everything yeah. else is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Phantom Menace. When they talk about the machete order, when you like, you're supposed to first show it to somebody. You show them four, five, and you completely skip Phantom Menace, and then you do two yeah. and three, and then Jedi: Return of the Jedi. So I come from a weird. I, I actually think that the third one is probably the third best one. Uh, you talking about Revenge of the Sith? Yeah, Ooh. yeah. Not for so much the movie, so much, but the storyline. Sure. You know, is, is, is pretty fantastic. And, you know, it certainly could have been done better, don't get me wrong. Yeah. But the storyline just kind of carries it through. You know, it's that, that story that you've always thought about, but you never actually got to see on film. So I would, yeah. I, I definitely thought the third one was probably the third best one. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, and I mean, I'm enjoying Kenobi, too. I'm enjoying, I enjoyed Boba Fett. I enjoyed Mandalorian, you know. I think, yeah. like I said, I think Star Wars really thrives on television. Uh, we got a few minutes, Blaze. You got any uh, shout-outs or anything, last final words? Oh, jeez, I don't know. Gee, I'm an old man. I'd shout out to my kids, but they're probably not going to listen to my podcast if I had to go. Um, no, I don't know. I mean, just I'd shout out to anybody that still listens to good music, you know, and I guess good music is in the eye of the beholder. I know what I like. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly, exactly. All right, well, Blaze, um, thank you so much for joining us, brother. Um uh like i said if you like what you hear here you can uh click on that like button click on the subscribe button click on the little bell for notifications comment share do all that i mixed up that order but um blaze thank you so much brother i really appreciate you and hopefully we'll have you back again all right sounds good thank you i'll try and make some uh 
some controversy so that we can make it interesting. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank you so much. All right, guys. Namaste. Jobless. Be good. Thanks, Blaze. Take care. Bye-bye.